Yeah, let's start. Uh, sorry, I was just picking a Docker for you guys. Okay, so uh, this is the fourth session um, of a full stack development. Um, so just want to make it as useful as, uh, as possible for the people who are here. Um, so let's build a small feature and let's actually talk about Docker for a little bit. Um, I don't have any slides, but I think I'll just explain it uh, based on the Docker file um, and Docker Compose. Uh, and we can try to start it up together, uh, see how it works. Because essentially for the deploying next time, uh, we'll use this service called Docker, um, which is to some extent, uh, for me, it's like a mini version of, uh, of Kubernetes. Um, I don't know if, if any of you have an idea what Kubernetes is, uh, but essentially a cluster um, that manages uh, microservices. Uh, so Docker could be useful for that. Um, so let's, let me just share the screen and um, we'll review what's done and what we should, what we have left. So I did some, did some work on the front end. Uh, since we last left off uh, the last session, um, push some changes. Um, as we talked, uh, the three main things we were working about, the courses, displaying the page to display all the courses, the page to display a single course, and then the model to submit a course rating. Um, so we, didn't, we only finished up on uh, displaying all courses to an extent. Uh, so I just had to finish up on my own, the single course and submit course rating model. Uh, and I pretty much push all the code to the master. Uh, so feel free to push if you want to follow along. Um, for, for today, I just wrote two things. Uh, the one, the first one that we all kind of agreed on is adding ability, uh, the second one, upvoting the course review. Um, and then the second one is adding ability to add comment to the review. Um, so I think we can just prioritize that voting the course review for now. Uh, so for that feature, we would need on a back end. Uh, we, I'm just thinking we'll probably need to add a new field um, to the existing um, table of the of the rating, and then for just simplicity of it, we'll just ask, up, up, allow to uh, upload as much as possible because essentially, if you don't have a user logged in. Uh, you can't really track who upvoted and who voted how many times. Um, so we'll just do it kind of the dummy version of it by just uploading as many times as possible. Um, and then and then we'll talk a little bit about Docker as you all requested. Um, so let's jump into the code. Uh, let me start up the backend. Question, uh, are we gonna do migrations yes. since we already have like some entries in the database? Uh, yeah, that's a great question, Saeed. Um, and I'll explain a little bit what migration is. Uh, migration is very applicable to SQL databases um, and you mainly do them for the data consistency because if you have already data in a database and you, for example, adding a new column uh, and in our case, it's gonna be upload, the previous records won't have that column um so that potentially can cause the issues uh when you're trying to retrieve the data and trying to access the data because the column won't exist um and since we're using NoSQL, um we won't be doing migration so we'll just check if it doesn't exist we'll just return zero um not not necessarily the best solution that i can think of uh essentially uh we should be using migrations all the time uh, but for the sake of time, we'll just skip this for now. Gotcha, thanks. Um, so let's go to the folder and let's start up the backend. Also a little bit updated the course on the backend. Uh, so feel free to push the uh, pull the changes. Uh, I'll just start up the backend. NPM run start. And it's running on a four five thousand, and then I'll start the front end. And meanwhile, it's starting. Uh, yeah, 
I also, let's, I'll show you around what have been improved. So that's the landing page. Uh, we just had it on top. I just center it in the middle. Um, it takes the link to all the courses. Uh, I just did very quick car boxes, nothing too impressive. Uh, just something very simple and easy uh, with the title on top. Uh, and then once you click on it, uh, it takes you to the actual course. Nothing fancy, just some text displaying here with the ratings. It actually shows the cards with the rating. Um, so just did a little bit of work uh, so we can actually see some of it on front end and don't spend a lot of time building just the basic functionality. Um, and also edit the model uh, to rate the course. Uh, it's very simple with the, with the material UI. Um, so if you, if you want to kind of follow along, just feel free to uh, clone the most up-to-date code. Um, so what I'm thinking is that for the upvote, we could probably like add a button right here, uh, right on a card, which would say upvote. Uh, and then we'll have like an additional field that would show the number of upvotes. Um, and based on that, we can, uh, uh, we can show the upvotes. Um, so let's start with the backend. Uh, let me open the backend. Just make it bigger. Than okay. Uh, so our backend application. So let's first modify the table, which is essentially the rating entity. Uh, so we essentially just want to add a new number. Um, so we just copy existing uh, existing column and just change the name of it. We'll just call it upvotes. Um, I would also assume type type of RAM can do like some default uh, type of things. So if you want to default the column to zero, um, that would be it. So we can actually look it up how to do that. Although I think if you insert the number, it will be zero. Uh, so we just leave this for now. And then on a ratings controller, uh, we'll probably need a new route uh, to modify the existing rating. Um, so the way we essentially would want to modify any resources, there are two types of requests. Uh, there was a put and there was a patch. Uh, so put is if you, for put, you would send the entire resource in and by resource, I mean the entire entity. Um, for the patch, you will send only individual, uh, individual fields of those entity. Um, so in our case, I think patch would be better because we only want to modify uh, the upvotes. We don't really care about modifying uh, the entire uh, the entire object. Um, so we are in ratings routes.ts and we'll just add the new route to the ratings, uh, which will be patch. Uh, and we will need to find the rating by the ID. Uh, so we'll just add the, add the URL parameter. Uh, we won't necessarily validate the request because uh, we probably don't have enough time. Um, but here, just let's do upvote rating. But essentially, what validate request does is checks the body that we're sending in uh, from the front end. And in case if some fields are not provided, um, then you can throw an error, which is 422 on processable entity, and you don't allow it to the proceed further. Um, which, which is very good validation kind of um, practice because you don't want to access your logic if the data that's being supplied is, uh, is incorrect. Um, so let's go to the ratings controller and let's just copy existing one. Um, so upload rating. So create the new function. So essentially, um, the idea that we trying to do is that uh, we are retrieving ID from request of the rating that we're trying to upvote, upvoting the rating by modifying field and then returning updated object. Uh, so very simple, uh, nothing really too complicated at all. Um, the way we we'll do it, I'll just kind of look at the courses controller and see how we retrieve object by ID, uh, which is right here. Uh, we did this with course. Um, 
So we just access uh, request parameters course ID. Uh, so we'll do here the same, uh, except it will be rating ID. Um, and then we'll be use a rating repo to find one by the ID. Uh, so here's our rating. Um, once we retrieve, so that's retrieve ID from the request. Uh, that's right here. We retrieve the ID and then we retrieve the object from the database. Um, and once we did that, we can actually directly modify the uploads field. Can you, can you go back to routing real quick? Yes. Let's go back to routing. Um, oh, okay, so that's it, thank you. Yeah, so I think what Said was wondering is that how did I know uh, what params to use? You essentially define your parameter here. So if you would call this ID, you would reference this request params as an ID. Um, so in this case, uh, we we define as rating ID. So we reference this as rating ID. And let's uh, import this function. Um, so go here, uh, the way we can just modify the uploads, rating uploads plus one. Uh, and then we just save, save the object. I assume this should work. And then once we save it, save doesn't exist. Oh, we have to do repo save. Okay, so we just save the response say rating uh, and then once we did that we just want to return the updated object which is essentially rest json um, rate um, and i think for the sake of it since um since the whole like since the whole request uh we um we just patched uh to the rating and we didn't really provide it any fields in the body um i think we can also rename the route to be a little bit more specific uh so we can do rating id and we can call this upload um so this is goes to upload um because otherwise like it doesn't really make sense what fields we're modifying because we don't really retrieving anything from the body uh so we we'll patch to this um so this will be upvote, kind of make make more sense in um, in that sense. Uh, so let's actually try it. Uh, let's see. I think the backend is running. Uh, so the backend is running, and let's just open the Postman. Um, uh, So let's just insert the new new rating. So we get the ID of the rating back. Uh, I get the ID back and then let me try to modify it and call upload and see what it does. Um, interesting, interestingly, it didn't return the upload. Okay, let's put some patch. Cannot patch upload. Let me see what the error is. It's four or four API ratings. Um, okay, uh, let's just debug on what exactly happening. Um, define the patch route on the upload. Uh, let me see in, uh, in app. So that's ratings. Let me see if I ratings API version one ratings, and this is ID of the uh, of the rating that I received, and I call upload. So it cannot patch. Um, this also could be an error with the fact that it can't find the the rating. Um, so let's actually just do some debugging and console log things. Um, rating server params. You're logging after uh, after you define. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think the another issue is uh, our server doesn't restart, uh, so I might have to restart it myself. Um, 
I also uh, just just kind of a small uh, small tip. You don't really want to restart the server all the time. Uh, that's just kind of a waste of time. Uh, so the way I build it, you also have this dev script, which uh, runs Nodemon, which is essentially restarts your server every time you make any changes. Um, so I would definitely recommend using that. It already happens on the front end automatically, but on the back end, you have to put it yourself. Um, so let's um, let's try to add the upload, uh, insert the rating again. That works. And then let's use this ID. I'm curious, doesn't supply the upload either. Okay. And then let's use this ID and try to patch again. Yep, so it returned and then upvotes is null. Okay, so upvotes is null is probably because we do have to define like a, maybe a default value, um, but it did return it, uh, but it did return it. Uh, so upvotes is a number here. Um, we did modify it just directly here. Um, which I, I mean, in my opinion, should work. So let's actually figure out how to do a default value and type RM. Um, and maybe that would make this work. Provide default value for Boolean, and we can just define default here on a column. Um, which I think before insert, you can do this. Is active. Okay, so it just allows to define it like this, uh, or even maybe this would work. So this is Boolean, but we can apply it um, to the number. So it's just column, and then number, and then default is zero. Um, so let's go back, upvotes, this was correct. Let's restart the server. Uh, which I'm just going to run the dev script. Uh, so it restarts automatically for me. Yes, uh, go back to Postman. Uh, let's try to insert the new rating again. And then we'll try to upload it. Which I'm curious why it doesn't re return the upload to me when I try to insert on a first sentence. Uh, still upload says no. Um, so I think that's um, could be modifying it incorrectly. Um, single field. Um, So let's actually try this method that's not going to work. Um, so I think part of it could be because as Said mentioned before, we didn't like run the migrations. Uh, so the table uh, doesn't know about this field. Uh, and actually, let's actually check in the database and see um, uh, what's going on. And if it's actually sees the, uh, if it's actually sees that field, uh, rating and then the new ones it returns as non-identified and I think that's back probably to the way we create the rating uh, let's actually go back I, I think I realized what the error could be right here when we create the rating we don't provide the upvotes uh, so let's provide the upvotes um, we set it to zero by default uh, I think that's why I might not run this operation because it doesn't know how to add one to not identify object. Um, I think so you can add some logic to if, if if the field doesn't exist already, then we can like default it to zero right here so that we don't have to write a migration. Yeah, yeah. No, that I mean, that's that's essentially you could do that right here. So we can, for example, check if rating upvotes. Um, if it exists, we just directly upvote it. Um, and if it doesn't exist, uh, we just set it to one. Um, I think that's that's a great suggestion, Said. So let's let's try that. Um, so if we go back to Postman and we try to upload, 
So upvote is one. Uh, so I think Saeed's suggestion work. Uh, so essentially, or just kind of recap, um, right here is that when you try to upvote the current rating, since we already have the ratings in the database and some of them don't have uh, this field defined, uh, we first check if this field exists or if it's defined, uh, it essentially does two things at the same time. And if it's already exists and it's defined, we can just uh, add one to it. Um, and if it doesn't exist uh, or if it's not defined, we could just assign it to one. Um, so that's kind of serves in this, um, in this case, it does serve um, like to some sort of a small migration hack but uh, in a big like scalable applications, you would actually need to run like a script um, that would modify all the existing ratings and would set them, uh, would set the uploads to zero. So you, your, your data is consistent um, across your database. Uh, does it make sense how we uploaded the rating or the backend? Okay. Um, yeah, pretty simple. I mean, that, that, nothing crazy. Uh, so let's let's do some front end work. Uh, and I think we kind of last time we were cut a little bit short, uh, so we didn't do a lot of logic. Um, but let me find yes code open in the background. Um, let me kind of explain what happened. Uh, since since last time we we touched the front end, so the home page nothing new, uh, just two uh, just kind of text. Uh, that's all we have. I just added some styling, so it looks nice. Uh, for all the courses, um, what happened is that we all talked about this get all courses function, which is essentially retrieves the courses from the. Uh, from the from the backend and back end returns from the database and returns to the front end. Uh, here we check if it's loading and if it does, we kind of show it in, we showing some some text, some loading data text. And then once we loaded it, we just map over all the courses. Um, and then we just show a card, uh, which is essentially just a course name, uh, a course department. And we also showed the ratings. And just for the sake of niceness of it, I just took the first two ratings. Um, and I showed the professor name and I showed the rating. Um, so nothing really complicated, a lot of code uh, seems like, but it's just a lot of bunch of container wrappers uh, that Material UI provides. But at the end of the day, what it does is just maps over course. And um, and just shows the data on the on the front end. Um, okay, and then um, so the way we would go to a single course, uh, we provided that link, uh, which is the last time we had a little bit bug with. We didn't know how to go to it, so that's just with two uh, courses dash and a course ID. Um, and then once we once we go to that link, we enter the course, uh, which is I did add some logic here, which we use params, uh, which is essentially the URL params that you have, um, and we retrieve the ID of that course. Uh, then we got that course. Uh, same same principle that we use in all the courses. Uh, we use use effect, which is essentially runs once when you load your uh, your component. Uh, then we retrieve the course uh, using that ID that we took from the params. Um, then we set the course as a state and we set loading to false. And um, some code here, but kind of similar to what's happening on courses. We checking if, if it's loading, if it's loading, we're showing some data. And once it's loaded, we showing the course name. Uh, we calculated the average difficulty and average, uh, average rating. Um, and we also just show the button, uh, which essentially rated course. And then we also show all the ratings. So we're just mapping of all the ratings. Um, and then we show what's the current rating is, what's the difficulty is, if you want to take it again or not, and what the professor name. Um, so not, nothing complicated, no any crazy logic. 
uh, just simply retrieving the data from the back end and showing the data on the front end um, in just a very nice way. Any questions what's happening on a course? Okay, and then um, in order for us to rate that course, uh, let's go to the UI. Um, where's my browser here? The way we want to rate the course is that we want to open up the model uh, and we want to provide some values to the fields. And once that values are provided, uh, Roth, we want to submit that and we want that to show up on that screen. Uh, so that's a little bit complex logic. I'll, I'll explain to you right now, but that's how we rating the course uh, visually. And the way we do it on in the code itself is that we just have a model component, um, which we open using just the same state operations uh, set open. Um, nothing complicated, same with the toggle loading, uh, same idea. Then in the rating model itself, um, we have a model um, and then we just have a bunch of fields uh, that we define. So first field is just the rating of the course, which is essentially just a slider. Uh, we just provided the default value. We provided the minimum value, we provided the max value, we provided the steps. And we provided the marks, which is essentially one from five. Uh, we repeat the same thing with the difficulty. Um, and then we added the checkbox for the Boolean. Um, and then after that, we also provided the text field uh, for the professor name. Uh, so that's our form. Uh, nothing really complicated is essentially think of it as just like some sort of data input um that, you, that lets you capture the data that user inputs uh the real thing that i want to touch on is the way how we actually assign um, the changes that the user does in the browser uh, so for example if we go back to ui um, once user moves the slider the values gets automatically updated and uh, we do that using a specific react function um, calling on change. Um, so let's, for example, take the professor name, right? So the value of that field is a professor name, uh, which is essentially our state. And then every time this field changes, it will call this on change function, which is essentially we, uh, we supplying this function. So handle professor name change. So if we go to this function, what's happening here is that we receive an event so every time the user types in in the browser uh, in a field, uh, the event getting uh, getting popped, uh, and that event essentially uh, gives us the value of the field, uh, and then we just retrieve that value from the event target value, and then we assign it to the state. Um, and it's just like one of the things that. Um, React does, you have to kind of do handle on change and modify the field directly itself. Uh, you unfortunately can't bind to it. Um, so, and we do the same thing with both uh, rating, uh, difficulty sliders, and we're doing the same thing with, uh, with, the, with the Boolean, the checkbox that we have, if we want to take it again or not. Um, so kind of same idea, you just uh, assign the value to the field, and then every time the field changes, you run the function, uh, which is essentially takes that event, uh, takes the value of that event, and then assign this to local state. And that's how the whole component gets updated. And uh, that's how we actually showing the nice UI on the front end. So does that, that whole front end process make sense how we change the values and the inputs? Yep. Okay. I think it's easier in Svelte, right? Yeah, other frameworks, the, um, I think in Angular or two, like Angular and Vue, you can directly bind to the to the field. Uh, so for example, if you do like, uh, for example, if you take text field, 
value here. Every time you update the value, the professor name automatically updates uh, for you. So you don't have to do this on change function. Um, in view, it's kind of hidden under thing called V model, which is essentially a value and then add input, but it does everything for you. Um, so it's, it's either maybe a React does in some way, but I wasn't able to find it. So I just kind of had to write the on change functions. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a little bit of a pain, uh, but it's not too complicated. Essentially this all handle on change, you can optimize, you can check which, which ID you're getting. So you can detect which field you're getting. And then you can provide like one function which would assign the proper state uh, based on the field it's ID more, that more you get. Flexible. More what? Is it more flexible than, than just binding it as well? No, I mean, definitely not. I mean, like, just like if you bind the value directly and what, what I mean by binding, that might not make sense uh, to everybody, but if you bind your, if you bind your state uh, variable to the, to the variable that stores the value of the input, every time you change the value of the input, um, your state variable gets updated. Uh, while here we have to do it ourselves. Um, so it's definitely more painful to do it ourselves. Even if we like write one function that takes care of all the cases, you still need to write every single case. Um, so it's still it's still more work than, than other frameworks like Vue and Angular and Svelte allow you to do. Okay. Um, any questions on on the state in React and how we update it? Okay, so let's actually upvote. Um, let's add the button uh, to the course. Uh, so go to the course and let's actually, so first of all, let's add the new field. Uh, since we just received the upvote, uh, we'll just, uh, actually display it on the front end, the number of upvotes the rating has. Uh, so upvotes. Um, and if we go to the interface, I have defined the interfaces. I just copy them and paste it from the back end. Uh, so we just need to do upvotes here, uh, which is a number, uh, but it could be, um, so it could be undefined. Uh, so there are two ways of handling that. Either on the front end, we check if it's un undefined or on back end, we can um, give it a default value um, if it's undefined. Um, the way I would just do it, I would just do it on the front end for now. But I think the proper way of doing it is uh, doing it on the back end uh, because you, want, you essentially don't want the front end to do a lot of logic with the data. Uh, so if you say like the front end is supposed to receive this um, set of fields and they always define front end should never really care if those fields exist or not. They just, if you define they exist, they should exist. Um, but for the sake of time, we'll just do it on the front end because uh, it will be a little bit faster. Um, so here we do rating upvotes. Um, and then it, it might not show. So let's see what, what it would render on the page. Uh, it says it doesn't exist on type rating. That's probably because I didn't save something. Uh, Fail to compile, uploads doesn't exist on type rating. Uh, rating uploads right here. Uh, let me see if, if it failed here. Doesn't exist on type rating. Uh, let's restart. It's weird because I defined an interface. Uh, maybe something didn't go. Okay, so we go here, we go to the course and right here it's upvotes. It just shows nothing, um, which is fine. I think in this case, we're not gonna worry too much about the way it looks, uh, but here where we did add the upvotes, um, it shows one here and zero here since we inserted. And um, when we insert it, we default it to zero. So it has the upvotes here. Um, so let's actually add the button to upload that field. 
So let's go back to the course. And then right here, right on the bottom, we'll just add the button. Uh, and I'll just copy the button. And um, I'll just define the, the class really fast. Um, I'll just copy the paste from the from the previous classes. So uh, I'm just adding some styling so it looks nice. Uh, and I'm just copying the pasting those styles from the from the courses that page which uh, the button that kind of had the uh, the department name. Uh, so I'll just copy the same styles because um, it is kind of similar how I want it to look. And I want to upvote and then on click. I'm defining the function that I'll call once I click on the button. Uh, and uh, let's actually upvote rating. And um, so let's define the function and I'll, just, I'll show you some nice trick uh, with, uh, with JavaScript that I like to use a lot. Uh, so it's, let's see if we upload, upload buttons here. It kind of looks huge. Uh, so let's, let's maybe decrease the font size. Uh, um, sorry. Yes. I may, um, can we use libraries like Bootstrap to just take care of the styling? Yes, yeah, so uh, that's a good question. Um, essentially, end of a, like, so here what we're using is we're using Material UI, uh, which is essentially like another component library. Um, so I think end of the day, you have to, to define like the default set of global styles that are always applied. So like with fonts, for example, uh, you have to like add the um, uh, still have to like add the global styles. I think what what some frameworks allow you is, for example, you can go here and you have like a class name, and you can just like write a string. So if you want like like if you want it to be flex, you just like write, write D flex, and you can do like justify content, uh, justify center, and you can do like blue, and like automatically does it for you. Uh, yeah, I think you can do it. So if there was one of them is Tailwind C, uh, C, C, uh, CSS. Um, so Bootstrap is a little bit heavy and it uses jQuery and you don't really want to use jQuery in, uh, in 2021. Uh, so I wouldn't recommend using Bootstrap. I would definitely recommend look at the Tailwind CSS. Uh, we use it at work and uh, I mean, it's it's simple. You just you just have to memorize, and also you have to memorize the shortcuts, and also the the VS Code has like special extensions, so it will like tell you exactly uh, which which shortcuts you should use, and kind of like auto types it for you. Uh, so that's super useful. But I just wouldn't recommend using Bootstrap. Uh, that's the only thing. So try to try to look in Tailwind uh, if you're interested into uh, into using. Uh, kind of the class-based definitions. Uh, the way I always did it, I just like to define the styles, uh, which as I said, I'll show you, I just take them from Figma, right? So we have a Figma designs here and here was like my button, for example, and I have all the CSS styles right here, right? So like if I work with the designers who like already build this and they have all the CSS styles for me, um, I don't really want to like go in and see like if I type in blue and that's going to be exactly that blue that they define. Um, so I think like once you work with uh, more customizable applications, uh, you would kind of have to use custom CSS instead of just writing like, I want this to be blue. Uh, you can also define what blue is. Um, and I mean, there, there are uh, benefits and uh, side effects of each solution. Uh, that's just the way I prefer it. But as I said, look into Tailwind CSS. Uh, it's a good, good, good library. And uh, a lot of browsers, I actually saw like last week, they will be loading Tailwind, Tailwind CSS uh, files by default. So you essentially don't ever have to load the CSS files. They are actually going to be preloaded in the browser, uh, which makes your application works faster. Okay. Okay. Uh, so let's uh, let's go to the course. Let's see the button. Okay, I decreased the font size. Uh, it has this weird hover, uh, which kind of drives me crazy, but I think it's okay for now. 
uh, <laughs> just, just hides the whole thing. Um, so let's actually define the function. Uh, so here is a, a small issue that we're having, right? So we're iterating over the all ratings, and then we actually want to upvote individual rating, right? So if we want to upvote the individual rating, we need to pass the rating ID to it. So the way we could do it is that we could just do rating.id. But the way React works is that if you just provide this argument to this function, instead of just providing this argument to the function, what it would do, it would actually call the function uh, once you render once you render the component. So I'll show you what happens. So here, console log uh, calling function uh, rating ID, which is a string. Uh, so let's go to the browser and let's try to, it actually doesn't want to let me do that. Yeah, so React doesn't even, yeah, it says type void right here. Essentially type void, void is not assignable to type mouse event handler, undefined. So it doesn't, doesn't even let me do that. Uh, so if I want to define a function, which will be taking in the, um, the parameter, I have to do a function within a function, um, which is, um, could be a little bit crazy in the beginning, but the way we do it is that um, we have like the wrapper function, which takes the, the event itself, which is the mouse click, and then the inner function that will take will be taking in the parameter. Uh, so the way we do it is something like this. Um, so it takes the, so this thing will be taking in the event uh, and then event is just mouse event, I think. And then, and then the inner function takes in the, the, the parameter that we want to supply. And then you can access this parameter within the function. Um, so it's, it, it could be very, let me see if that's allowed me to do it. Uh, it still doesn't like something. Uh, props undefined. Yes, so it's just uh, the type is incorrect. Uh, so I just have to copy the proper type. Uh, type is not type assignable. It's not assignable to string. I actually could have gotten it wrong, um, and it might be the other way around. So let me see, uh, which I don't think is correct, but. Uh, upload the rating type is not assignable. Uh, mouse event is not assignable. Okay, so type right here. Uh, yeah, let me see if it works it or not. It's not generic. Uh, let's just for now, I'll just use any. I don't think it matters too much. Uh, okay, any seems to work. Uh, so let's console log this rating ID too. Um, let's look if this works or not. So if we upload calling the function, but it doesn't provide the, the ID to us. Uh, rating ID doesn't give it to us, uh, which, is, which is not what we wanted. Um, let me see, let me also log the event. Uh, and see what's on the event. Well, and then we see the event. Okay, so here's the ID. So it's just the update. Um, so the way we did it, uh, we define the function within the function and uh, the other function actually received the rating ID. And then, uh, then the event is being propagated. Uh, and then this takes in the event, which is essentially the mouse click. And then we can actually uh, access both parameters because um, the way it would work, it would be like, just like, this is the function and this is also a function. Uh, so you can, you can access the parameters of the, of the parent function uh, within the child function. This is just a nice hack because otherwise uh, you would have to do like anonymous function, uh, which is something like this. Uh, and this is essentially will take in the event, which is supplied and on click. Uh, 
And the way you don't wanna do this, uh, so this is called anonymous function. And you never pretty much want to do anonymous function simply because every time you re-render, um, every time you re-render the component, this function will get reinitialized. So for example, if you have a huge application, you have tons of anonymous functions. Every time it will get reinitialized, it's more work for the browser. So your website will be significantly slower. Uh, so you want to reduce that load uh, and you don't wanna do anonymous functions. Um, so here, uh, does, does, does how this function works make sense? Okay, okay, perfect. Uh, uh, so let's, uh, so we get this ID. So let's actually make the backend call. Uh, I'll just copy the call from the rating model, which is essentially a post request, um, which is, this is a post request, but we'll be sending a patch request. Uh, so right here, we will send patch and then ratings, and we will use the rating ID, and then we call this uh, uploads. Uh, and then the patch doesn't, we just need supply empty body, I think, or we don't have, even have to supply anything. So this just needs to be an async function. Uh, so we can use a wait. Um, did you need to mark this function as async? Sometimes my uh, my ID is a little bit slow on things, so I have to I have to refresh async, assign it as async, and then this is a function. Uh, I should be able to assign this. Uh, then async functions, do you mean to mark this functions async? So I think this is complaining about this particular function. Uh, yeah, here we go. So I don't have to define this one as async. Uh, so we just send the patch request that we send in the postman. Uh, we'll get back the updated rating and um, then we can just reassign that rating to the state, uh, which will be a little bit tricky. Uh, so the way we will, uh, the way this function will work, we'll just toggle the loading state. We'll make the patch request, and then we'll get the updated rating back, and then we reassign it to the state, and then we toggle loading as false. So the way we want to reassign this uh, upload back to the state, uh, the way the state works in React, it's uh, immutable, so you don't directly, uh, so you don't directly modify it. Uh, so you actually have to copy the entire course object and you have to modify that rating directly. Um, so the way you can do it is that you can do set course. Um, and then here's essentially you just completely overriding uh, the existing course. Um, so the way you can do it is you can copy the existing course using the spread operator. Um, and then in the particular ratings, um, you can map over all the ratings, you map rating. And then here is um, once you map over all the ratings, you can upload the specific rating um, that you just upload in the backend. Or you can actually, what you can do is that you can map over the rating and then if rating ID is equal to the rating ID uh, that you're trying to upvote, uh, you can return uh, the update rating that you received from the backend. And then if it's not, uh, then you can just return the rating itself. Um, so let me see if this is going to work. Yep, so type N is unassignable to type course rating. So we'll just say, uh, course, so if that actually works. So let's actually cast this to, um, to S course because uh, I define it as null. So TypeScript thinks like it could be null. So it does like a null type check. And also it doesn't know that updated rating is rating. 
circle. So we just cast it to, I think this should work. Uh, is that so expression like this? Uh, and still doesn't like this. Uh, type rating, type string is not assignable to type. Uh, type property ID are compatible. Because uh, I think this could be null too. Uh, so let's actually call this a rating. Um, so sometimes it's just text could be bugging and see uh, types, type of ID incompatible. Uh, and the way I'm doing it right now, I'm just trying to cast everything, uh, which I probably wouldn't recommend doing too much. Uh, I would actually try to figure out why it's not working, uh, but since we don't have a lot of time, um, don't want to, to spend too much time debugging. Uh, ID types, types rating, map, courses, course ratings, type ID, okay. so type string. Uh, Um, so the problem, argument of type, ID, string, and define. Okay, so I guess it doesn't, okay, so I think we'll do it here as a right, a right here too. Um, maybe this will help, but just still, still doesn't like the fact that course could be undefined. Uh, so sometimes we could just check that the course is defined. And then we can just map again course readings. Yep, so that's work. Uh, so sometimes like the TypeScript likes to complain. I mean, it doesn't like to complain. It's just uh, course could be null because right here when we do the set state, uh, we just uh, set it to essentially this is null. Um, the way you can do it, you can just init it to some value, uh, but I just made it now here. So every time, uh, so essentially your course is going to be either type of course or undefined. Uh, so pretty much everywhere in a component, you just need to check um, if it's uh, if it's exist or not. Uh, so that should work. So let's go to the UI. Uh, let's try to upload this one. Okay, so it says four on four, uh, not found ratings upvotes. Uh, let me see, I think it called upload instead of uh, uploads. Yes, so quick fix, upload. Uh, uh, let's try to upload this one. Yep, so that worked. Um, so we just click the button and let's try it again. So that's two now. Let's try it again. That's three now. So we can keep clicking and keep uploading the thing. Um, so that's pretty much works. Uh, uh, so does this does this function make sense? How we got uh, how we got to modify how we got to call the backend, get the updated object, and set it back. Uh, to our state. Okay. Um, if that makes sense, let's actually talk about Docker a little bit. Uh, so we got, I'd say, 30 minutes left. Um, um, so let's actually go to the backend and uh, let's talk about Docker. And let's let me actually make the Docker file dot dev, um, and I have made the Docker file. So let's just talk a little bit about uh, what Docker is uh, and what's the whole point of containerization. Um, so to me, there essentially there was essentially one issue. So. Every time you run your application on your dev environment, on your local computer, you make the application dependent on the settings that you have within your computer. So for example, let's assume we're running 
like just a node application. Our application is dependent on the node version that we're running it on. Um, so if, for example, we're running it on version 12 and someone is running on version like five and their application is not working, you can't really debug it because you don't really want to downgrade to version five and try to figure out what's going on. So that's 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 the first issue. So you make you make your application be dependent on the on the computer or like on the server that you're running it on. So every time you would try it on a different computer, so you could have some weird bugs. And it doesn't happen too much with Node, but it does happen a lot with like Java, or like some compiled languages. Uh, it could happen a lot with probably Golang. Um, so the way that you want to approach that is you want to isolate your dev environment um, and you want to isolate your application environment from other, uh, from other environments, right? And that's what you use Docker for. So Docker, what it is essentially is just a small operating system uh, that runs within some container. And um, once, um, once you start up your application, you just copy all of your application resources to that container, and then you can just do all the same things you're doing locally, but you do it in the container. And what it allows you to do is that it actually allows you to define what container you're running it in. And uh, it also allows you to isolate it from any tools that you have on your local machine. So if, for example, some other dev would take in your code and try to run it, all they have to do, they just start up this container that already has a set of predefined uh, settings and, um, and then it will work just fine because you just ran it with the same container. And also when you try to deploy it to the production environment, all it would do, it would actually run it on that specific container instead of running it on the server um, server environment because so what happens if you like have different servers like you rent like aws instances and uh, you have multiple servers and all of them have different configurations like you don't want to go in into a server and you don't want to change the configurations just so your application could work all you want to do is just want to say hey here is my my settings for this small docker image that you can run and um, just please run within this docker within this within this container and then no matter what server you deploy it on it will be performing exactly the same while if you don't have the docker container uh, every time you have different servers it might perform a little bit different uh, so does it make sense why we would use docker uh, and what's the point of it yeah okay Okay, so for, yes okay so like for me right when i was I, I tried to follow along with the past few classes with uh windows as you know uh so f like what if we would have started from the beginning with docker would i still have had such pains with windows or is it also is that unrelated yeah, I mean, that's a good question. So that's that's essentially, I think you would have, it would be less painful for you um, to, to do it if we use Docker. Um, the thing is what also Docker allows us. So here, here is the way our local uh, setup works right now. So we have a database that we run within our uh, operating system. So you would run on Mac or Windows. And then you have the application. So every time you want to run in the application, you have to start up the database, start up the backend, and start up the front end. Mm -hmm. What the Docker could have allowed us is that using services like Docker Compose, which is essentially just a configuration file for multiple Docker containers, you would be able to start up the entire, entire application within the Docker containers. So you won't actually have to go and modify your existing operating system. All you would have to do is you would just have to run it in some isolating environment that would do everything for you and that's not not dependent at all on what's happening on your local machine so you can run it on windows linux or mac so of course it would be much easier 
Uh, and that's why a lot of teams do use Docker for the, for the dev environment uh, because they don't want to be dependent uh, on their own system and how you set up things. Because if you have a complex system, you could have like, you could have backend, you can have database, you can have some other microservices. And if you have like five, six of them and you have to start them up every single time, that's like tedious and that's very time consuming. So instead, you just want to use multiple Docker containers that you start up uh, independent of each other and independent of your local machine, and they would work within each other. Uh, Wait, so so yeah, would it be like, so if we were to use Docker with this project, so would it be like there's one Docker container for the front end, one Docker container for the back end, or like is it just one Docker container with everything in it? Now, essentially, the way you want to do it is you want to do one service per Docker container. Uh, so you don't want to do uh, you don't want to do multiple service in one Docker container. So you'll have one Docker container for database, one Docker container for backend, and one Docker container for the front end. Okay. Uh, so that's that's how it's usually done. Uh, so think of it as like a small microservice architecture, and um, where each each service has its own container. Uh, so that's essentially how, how you would do with Docker. Okay. Okay. So let me just talk a little bit about this uh, Docker file that, that we have right here. Uh, it, as I said, it just defines simple commands to mirror your dev environment, like your logo on your computer with what's going to happen on the operating system that's Docker defining. So first of all, we need some sort of base. We need some sort of operating system that we want to run it on. In this case, and you can actually run like a full on Ubuntu. You can probably run like, yeah, I mean, I think Linux are mostly free. So you'll probably run one of the Linux distributions. So you can run anything, but you don't really want to run a full on operating system because that would be too heavy. So that's why people came up with Alpine which is essentially just small version of all the necessary things you need in order to run your image. Uh, so there was Alpine for Node, which is essentially just um, gets like downloads the node and you can actually go online and you can see what it does exactly and what resources it downloads. Um, but that's the minimal version that you would ever need in order for you to run the node application. So you don't actually have to copy the entire operating system. Uh, so we can just start with node 12. Uh, we can also use like node 14 uh, if we want to. Uh, so it just, just depends uh, which node version we want to define. Um, and then we'll have a, we will define a work directory. Uh, we don't have to, we can, can just write, uh, we can, can just work directory be everything at the, at the splash. Um, but you kind of want to define a work directory because you don't want to run everything in a root. Uh, and then you will just copy the package JSON, um, which is essentially all your dependencies, and you will want to install them. And then you want to copy all the files. And the way, the reason why we do it is because Docker cache your steps. So, for example, if you would redefine the dependency, um, you would have to. If, so, for example, if you redefine the dependency or you add a new one, you would have to start from this line. So from line four, you'll have to go start and down. But if you just change one file in your entire file structure, but you didn't actually add, change the package.json, you change like some code, it would start from line eight. So that allows you to save time on recompiling the images and essentially allows you to work faster. So that's why you always with the Docker files, you always want to install the dependence. So you want to copy the file that defines the dependencies, install the dependencies, and you want to copy the rest of the files. Uh, that's in order for the uh, Docker to do the caching mechanism. Does that make sense? It's kind of a small trick that's, that's useful if you have like huge applications or if you restart all the time, uh, which happens a lot when you develop. Okay, uh, so just simple, we copy all the files and then we just run npm run start. Um, and uh, what, how we can do it is that how we can run this whole file so we can go back to the command line. I uh, will stop everything. And the way you would do it, you would do docker build, um, which is essentially just builds your image. 
uh, that you define in a Docker file. You also want to tag it, and tag is just like just the name of that specific image. Let me just close this one. Um, and then, so let's just let's just tag us for now, like the rate my course backend. Uh, so we, okay, and you also provide where the Docker file is located, which is essentially where we are, which is just dot. Um, so we want to build this, uh, this, this image that we just defined in Docker file. And it doesn't run for some reason. Cannot connect to Docker daemon. That's why, because I shut down the Docker right before the sessions. Uh, so I need to start the Docker. Um, And once it starts, try to run it again. So let's try to build it. Again, let me see if it's running. And it's still warming up. So it takes a little bit while to start up. Yes, yeah, so, so you can you could all see. So we are building the image, which is essentially what we're doing is that we just building some operating system and then we just perform all the steps that we define in the Docker file. So you could see here, for example, so first step is just copies the Alpine image, which is our operating system. Then we just copy all the dependencies. So now we are installing all the dependencies. We copying the rest of the files and now we are, um, we are running the rest. Uh, which is essentially copying the files and starting the application. Uh, but it actually won't start. Uh, so it would build the image, but you still have to start it using Docker run. Um, so let me see this. Okay, so it built it. So if we do Docker OS, I think, or Docker PS, it doesn't have the, it doesn't have the image, but we can do Docker images, I think. And it would have so data images grab rate. So rate my course back on. So you see, we built an image which is like 300 megabytes, which is still a lot for our small node application. Um, but that's essentially like this is essentially our operating system. So now we just want to run this operating system. And the way you do it, you just do Docker run uh, name of the name of the image that you just built. And since we're running it on a port, we want to map the port. So because Docker is just isolated environment and um, it just runs like within on your local machine, but it's still isolated environment, you still want to map the port because the application will be running within that isolated environment, but you still want your local machine to be able to communicate to that application. So in that case, you just need to map the port, uh, which is essentially tells give take the 500 a 5000 a port on the on the docker machine on the container and then map it to 5000 port on your local machine so let's try to run this unexpected token huh. i could have i could have defined port incorrectly unexpected token let me see 5000 Yep, so, so as you could see, we just started the same application, but we started within that Docker container and it failed and we all know why it failed. It failed because it couldn't connect to the database because as you would think of it, is your Docker container is completely independent and you have your local machine, which is completely independent. Uh, so in order for you to, uh, to map the Docker container back to your local machine or to another Docker container where you would run the, um, where you would run the, the database, it needs to be on the same network. Uh, and that's where essentially the Docker compose would come in and you can define the network. But yeah, that's kind of short of view of what Docker is. Uh, since since you guys requested, uh, do you guys have any questions? Uh, I think it's just a ton of material. Um, so, unless you guys have any questions or want to want for me to go over something uh, new, uh, I think we'll call it a day. 
Uh, the next next session will just do a deployment, uh, which will essentially will deploy the front end to Verisal, uh, which is one of CDNs uh, that Ayas talked about on Tuesday, not this Tuesday, but I think the Tuesday before. And then we'll deploy our backend using a tool called Docker, which is essentially I think you all should learn. I mean, this is the easiest way to deploy applications. And we'll deploy the backend on just EC2 instance on just raw server on a, on, a, on AWS. Um, so we'll do that. It shouldn't take, I mean, it should take around like the same hour or 15 minutes. Um, and we'll be able to access the application. And I, th I think we also need to deploy the database. Uh, so the database, it, it shouldn't be too bad. Uh, we'll just create the Atlas database, which already has the database for you. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, do y'all have any questions, any suggestions? Yeah, so next class is the last one or what? Yes, next, next, class, next class will be the last one. Mm. And uh, there should be a feedback form, which I don't have a link to. Uh, but let me see. Let me see if I stop sharing and find the feedback form. Um, but anyways, uh, let me see. Yeah, I appreciate you all coming. Uh, hope, hope you guys can learn something useful because um, as y'all knows, we use this pretty much every day. Uh, we do the same things every day at work. So uh, a lot of the stuff that I talk about is pretty much everything that I, I did in my workplace. Um, so it's, 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 it's very useful, uh, especially um, even after the Van DCS classes, which is just a lot of a lot of theory and a lot of things that you might never actually see at the job place. Um, so let me see if I have this feedback form, um, which I don't think I do. Oh, let's see. Hey, um, yeah. I wanted to ask if we'll need to create any Docker file for the for the database. So we'll have um, a Docker file for the database and the front end, and then another one for the backend. So that's like three uh, Docker files. Yeah. Yeah, essentially you do because, I mean, think of it like, like you don't want your database environment be dependent on your backend environment. So like think of it like if you have a hacker that like hacked into your backend, you don't want a hacker to be able to access your database. So you want to have a completely isolated environment. Like what if happens like if you, um, for example, let's assume like you're scaling a little bit, right? And you have like multiple backends running and you have like a database running. You don't want them to be running on the same image, right? Because like, what if one of your backend servers goes down, the other backend server could still support it. But if you had the back, if you had the database running on that container too, that would bring down the, the database too. So you want to separate them as much as possible. Uh, so that's why like, I would say, it's always one server per, per container. Uh, I think of it like that. So one for front end, uh, one for back end, one for database. For us, we won't actually have to do anything besides the back end because the front end, we don't need Docker container to deploy it. And for the database, we're not really deploying it uh, ourselves. We're kind of using the, the uh, the outsourcing thing that already defines the database for us. We're just going to connect to it. Um, but yeah, essentially you would have one service per, per Docker container. Yeah. Um, uh, so there is a file, uh, docker compose.yml. Yeah. Um, um, I used it on one of my previous projects to just like, um, 
uh, build the images for the for the database and then uh, and the backend and just like connect them using this file. Is, uh, are we going to use that in, in uh, on this project? Yeah. So, uh, let me see. Uh, so we we do have that Docker Compose file on the backend. So essentially, let me just explain what Docker Compose is. Docker Compose is essentially just the configuration file to run multiple Docker containers. And the way you would run multiple Docker containers by yourself is pretty much only locally. So Docker Compose is only used for the local development. So we just configure the, the backend, right? So you saw the backend running. And then the next step would be configuring the database. So we would we would go Docker Compose. We would uh, we would define multiple services. So the first service will be the backend. We'll start up the backend. The next service will be the, the database. We'll start up the database. And because we will do them within the same Docker Compose, it would actually assign them the same network so they will be able to communicate with each, within each other. So you only use Docker Compose when you do local development. And as Yo asked, like if he was running that on Windows, all he would have to do is he had to do Docker Compose up and it would start up the backend, the database, and whatever other services he needs. So you don't actually have to, you don't actually have to start manually anything. Uh, the reason I went without like Docker Compose is I thought it could be a little bit of overkill of explaining um, what exactly Docker is on the first session. Um, so I just decided to go with it, but in ideal world, or it's just on a word of uh, advanced, not advanced, but just, just good software development, you would use Docker and you would use Docker Compose to run locally. For all my projects I do, I use Docker. I pretty much never start things with NPM run start. Um, it's just not very good practice in general. At least I would, I, at least I would say. Maybe people would probably disagree with me, uh, but that's personally what I think. I think everything needs to be isolated in a Docker container. Um, okay, thank you. Um, so I still can't find the form, and nobody sent me the form. Um, so we'll just call it a day. Um, so I'll see you all next session at, in two weeks. Uh, so we'll just do the deployments and we can all just go to the website and play around with it. Uh, so that would be cool. Uh, so thank you and have a good weekend.